Okay, Jeremiah chapter 10 and 11. Now there's quite a bit here, so I don't know that I'm going to get through the second chapter. I really want to because it's important that I do, so I'm going to speak rather fast. I may skip over some things that I, I thought about doing, but we'll see what the Lord does. We're going to approach the scripture uh, it, it in a sense, ex, um, kind of a running commentary type of thing. So we'll just read through it and comment on, on things uh, at the time. Roman did a great job last week as um, he shared the his biblical background of what was going on at that time. And I just kind of got the idea, well, what was going on in the world at that time? And so I, I given you a little timeline there and you can see some of the things that were going on in the world at that time, which kind of blew me away. You know the whole story about Troy, right? And how Troy was sacked and how the, they had the, uh, the, the horse come in and men were in it and they were able to get through the walls uh, of this impenetrable city and destroy the whole city and so forth. That was going on during this time, apparently, in the world. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, the thing that I was ministered to uh, by the whole getting into the, uh, the what they call the I laid and the other is the odyssey period which is after the bronze period is that the world goes on doesn't it outside of what god is doing with his people you know kind of in a bubble in a sense there's a world outside of that and you see that in the old testament with israel you see god working with israel from the very beginning with in genesis when he created adam and eve and then they began to you know multiply and grow and then he began to work in their children children all the way through Ab you know abraham and then and then david and the you know the 12 tribes and so forth and and you just watch god kind of in a bubble with his own people while the world around them was going on you know, whatever was going on <clears throat> and at that time it was this whole Greek war with the Trojans and, and, and who knows what else, the Bronze Age and wars and battles that were going, the Babylonian War, and, you know, the Medes, the Persians that were all around there. But yet God was focused on his people. He loved the rest of the world. He loved them dearly. And, and of course, we see the provision in the Old Testament to let them come in and walk with us, but they need to follow you know, our commandments and so forth. So God never pushed them away. And we have the same thing today because God is working with what? The church, right? And so in a sense, we're here, we are the church working in the world, you know, that is around us. And what's going on in the world? You know, it's horrific to even think about what's going on in our world today. It's just some crazy stuff, you know, and there are believers that want to participate with that crazy stuff, you know, be a part of that crazy stuff because we were a part of it at one time. But God is working with us. And so it was interesting that God wants to work with the church. This is the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And he wants to do something special in this world to reach as many people as he can. But we have to participate in the body of Christ. There's the application is we need to be actively involved with the church because the church is what God uses. He doesn't use anything else. He uses the church and the people in the church to reach this world. There's no other means by which he uses. There, there, there's no other group of people. There are, there, there's no other philosophies out there. He uses the church and the, the government that he has established through the church itself. So it is important that we're involved with the church. Now, my first point here in chapter 10 is cultural relativism. Cultural relativism. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, we know that there's truth. At least we should understand what truth is according to biblical truth. Then there is relativism, which is someone's truth according to their idea of what truth is. There's also something called cultural relativism. And it is when the culture dictates what the truth is. And so it's not necessarily that they have a book, but the culture just moves in a certain direction de depending on who's directing it. It could be a corporation if it's clothing, you know, it, or makeup or, or styles of cars. You know, the, these corporations are moving the culture the way they want them to move. You know, that's why you have uh, bell bottoms in style and then after so many years they're out of style and then all of a sudden they're in style again because they know that after a while you have new generations they've never seen bell bottoms they don't even know what bell bottoms are and then they bring them into the uh, culture again and everybody goes crazy and they make a lot of money so corporations can move cultures 
Well, the culture is what dictates what truth is. And so God here is warning the children of Israel not to participate in cultural relativism. Is when the culture is dictating what truth is. We know as believers that truth is right here, the word of God, Jesus, him crucified, resurrected on the third day. God is truth. Jesus is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. The word of God is truth. That is what we should be following and that is all we should be following as believers. If you disagree with that, then you need to check your own heart. And whether you're a believer or not, because that is the first step of our Christianity is to know that the word of God is true 100 percent from Genesis all the way to Revelation and that you can depend on it is God's word. It's God's word. In fact, it is more wise than any man who is out there and claims to be knowledgeable in human behavior. It is more wise than any PhD or person that has a doctorate because this word is written by God himself. We're talking God who created the heavens and the earth, who made us and know how we are and what we're made of. And he knows exactly what we need or don't need. And we have a choice to whether submit to him or not to submit to him. That's really what it comes down to it has nothing to do with how we relate to one another because if we give a cup of water to the least we're we're giving it to jesus the bible says and so what we do to others is what we're doing to jesus and that's what scripture tells us so do not lean towards the other nations is what uh, god is saying here to jeremiah I love this little saying that I I, I read just the other day. A lie doesn't become a truth. Wrong doesn't become right. And evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. Let me read that again. A lie doesn't become truth. Wrong doesn't become right. And evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by the majority. And that's what's going on in our culture today, isn't it? And that's exactly what's going on here. Look at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, or hear, hear the word which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. The, new, the old King James says heathens. <laughs> we used to call unbelievers, remember a while ago, heathens. Oh, those heathens, but now they're Gentiles. So don't learn their way. If anything, we shouldn't even be reading the garbage that they put out. Sometimes I walk into Christian homes and I see some of these magazines and I'm like, oh, no wonder. It makes sense. (laughs) Why are we reading that garbage? Why are we looking at that garbage? You know, we shouldn't learn their ways. We should be naive to their ways. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. So the, the, the... the signs, you know, the, the, the stars and, the, you know, the which sign are you and, and all of these things that they use to determine uh, their direction in life, you know. For the customs of the people are futile. That's truth. People's customs are nothing. God's ways are far higher and better than the customs of people. For one cuts a tree from the forest and work and and the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe they decorate it with silver and gold they fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not topple sounds like a christmas tree doesn't it they are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak they must be carried because they cannot go by themselves do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor can they do any good. So there's two possibilities. It is, it is a tree, you know, and they stake it so it doesn't fall over. Or I, I think it's talking more about idols and how they take these idols and they prop them up and they pray to them and so forth. And God's basically saying, Jeremiah, don't, don't uh, fear those idols. They're nothing. So Jeremiah basically in these few verses are speaking against uh, us following the culture. In the New Testament, John tells us in 1 John two fifteen, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in you. The perfect example to measure your heart is 
Do you love the world more than you love God? And I'll, I'll say it again. If you have the opportunity to go somewhere on Sunday morning that's pleasurable in the world, then be here at church, then you love the world more than you love God. If you have the opportunity to, to serve, but there are other things that you want to do rather than that, then you love the world more than you love God. I, I think it's very clear and it's very simple. We, we complicate it too much. We start looking at, well, what does it mean to really love the world? And don't we have grace? And don't we have this? And don't we have that? Yeah, we have all of that. But John is clear. Do not love the things in the world. And if you do, the love of the Father is not in you. He also says in chapter 2, verse 16, For all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So not just the material things, the fleshly things, but also the pride of life itself. You know, boasting, your pridefulness in what you've accomplished and what you can do and so forth. These are all things of the world and they're all perishing. When it all comes to an end, when we're all gone here in a, thou a thousand years or a hundred years from now, what's really going to matter? What's going to matter is how we glorified God. That's the only thing that will matter. When we get to heaven, God will say, what did you do with my son? How did you glorify him? That is the only thing that will matter a hundred years from now. Matthew thirteen twenty two. Jesus said, and he who receives seeds among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. So following the culture and the direction of the culture and getting involved in the culture is not a good thing to do as a believer. The thing that will happen is, is you will become unfruitful towards the kingdom of God. You're wasting your time as a believer. And so this was going on at their time just as it is in our time. And, and Jeremiah is reminded that there's only one true God that we should serve. And so we come to verse 6. And as much as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great and your name is great in might. I, I love that phrase. I have it highlighted. Uh, in as much as there is none like you. I don't know what kind of relationship you have with God, but do you realize there's no one like Him? I love spending time with Him and just telling Him there's no one like you. The feeling and the peace that I get being in the presence of the Lord, it is amazing that there is nothing like that feeling. It is the feeling and the presence that keeps me going. Because there's enough in this world to, to, to discourage me, to keep me from going on. And there are times where I'd love to just stop for all kinds of various reasons. But then when I sit there and I pray to the Lord and I just enter into His throne room and I sense Him intimately, there's no one like Him. And so I can endure this for a little longer until he takes me home. That's what gets me through. There's no one like God. There's no one that can minister to my heart completely and fully like he can. There's no one that can understand me and my feelings and emotions than him. There's no one that knows what I think completely but him. And even when others don't believe me, he knows the truth. And he knows I know, and I know that he knows, and it's good. And when there's those insecurities that I have, he strengthens me and says, they don't care, and they don't matter. What matters is you know me. Who cares what people think about you? Who cares what they say about you? What matters is you know me. And, and in that time, there is no one like my God, because he understands me completely. That's what Jeremiah is saying here. He's great, and his name is great. Who would not fear you, O king of nations? For this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nations, and, all, and in all their kingdom, there is none like you. But they are altogether dull-hearted and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine. Silver is beaten into plates. It is brought from Tarshish, the gold of Upaz, the work of the craftsmen and of the hands of the metalsmith 
Blue and purple are their clothing. They are all the work of skillful men. That's why I believe it's a, an idol, because then he describes how this idol's made. But the, but the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to endure his indignation. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. He has made the earth by his power. Notice some of the things that he's saying here. He is the living God. That's our God. He is an everlasting king. He's forever. He's been here forever. He, he, he has always existed. No one created him. He has made the earth just by his power. He spoke it into existence. And he established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. He put everything into place and in its proper place. He knew exactly what he was doing when he did it. And so we have the earth and the sun and the stars and the moons and, and the planets and so forth. So we have our different seasons and times and winter and summers and, and so forth. God put everything together. That's the God that we serve. When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens. And he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasures, treasuries. Everyone is dull-hearted, without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by an image. For his molded image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are futile, a work of errors. In the time of their punishment they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is the maker of all things and Israel is the tribe of his inheritance the Lord of hosts is his name so you see how he's comparing himself to these metal smiths here's the metal smith and he has to take all of these woods and put them together and bang metals together and so forth and create this thing that really can't even speak can't even hear can't really help you and yet here's God who created everything who spoke it into the existence and you compare him to an idol that's so foolish to even consider. But we don't do that, do we? Don't we? How many of us take the advice of another human being over the Word of God? As though some human being has all the wisdom in the world. Or some psychologist. Or some PhD. Or some talk host radio person, you know? And yet... The word of God is God's word with all wisdom. And if we follow it, he'll bless us. But instead, there'll be a great commotion. Look at verse 17. Gather up your wares from the land, O inhabitants of the forest. For thus says the Lord, behold, I will throw out at this time the inhabitants of the land and will distress them that they may find it so. Woe is me for my hurt. My wounds are severe. But I say truly, this is an infirmity. And I must bear it. Now this is Jeremiah again, the weeping prophet, talking about himself again. This is, this is very difficult. This is very hard. You know, it, it's so sad uh, as a pastor when you see so much potential and people throwing it away. There, there's so much possibility and because of their stubbornness, because of their idolatry, because of the way they want to live, you know, they throw away the possibilities. I have a friend that's just, man, the guy is just so talented has a photographic memory. It's just amazing. I wish I had his mind. Can remember anything at any time. If he was here right now, I'd ask him, you know, 25 years ago when I lived in, in Redlands, what was my phone number? And he'd be able to tell you like that. I mean, that's just the kind of guy that just knows a lot of stuff, a lot of information, is, is just handy with a lot of technology and, and, and so forth. And, you know, he knows the Lord, but he's not really serving the lord he's not involved in the church he, he's doing other things that he that he enjoys doing with music and with uh, flying airplanes and and um at work and so forth and he's just enjoying life and you, you just go wow what potential there is there if they were just to get focused on god and what god could do with them you know? but again you have to ask yourself well then who would get the glory? 
and God uses the foolish things of this world sometimes. And he reminds me of that. You know, it's not always about the gifts we have, but the willingness to take a step of faith. My tent is plundered and all my cords are broken. My children have gone from me and they are no more. There is no one to pinch, pitch my tent anymore, pinch me, or to set up my curtains. For the shepherds or the pastors have become dull-hearted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore they shall not prosper and all their flocks shall be scattered. Behold, the noise of the report has come and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate, a den of jackals. O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. That's called I relativism. I relativism. Jeremiah says, A great commotion is coming, and that is, we know it to be Babylon, who will come and capture Judah here. And then he makes this profound statement that he knows the way of man is not in himself. That we are not capable of having the wisdom to run our own lives. I was talking with someone today on a certain subject. I'm not going to say exactly what it was. But one of the things that they mentioned and I agreed is we don't know what we're doing. (laughs) We don't know what we're doing. And that's true. We don't know what we're doing. You know, and a lot of times you approach situations like that. I have no idea what I'm doing, here. but God in his grace somehow gets you through it and you know it's him doing it. And what Jeremiah is saying is, is that we believe we know what we're doing. That's called I relativism. Again, what is truth? We know the Bible to be truth, God to be truth, Jesus' death, resurrection and so forth. God's word is completely true. Not me. Not my way. Not what I think is good for my life. It's amazing how young people, at least from what I have seen lately, are not being directed by the Lord. They're being directed by their own desires. I want to go and do this. I think that a young person who grows up in a home should be praying, especially in a Christian home, should be praying and asking the Lord, what do you want me to do, Lord? Not what you want to do. Because God wants you involved in His kingdom Not just going out and working. Not just going out and getting a job. Not going out and making money. He wants you involved in His kingdom doing something for His glory. That's what He wants you to do. But it's what I want to do and this is how I will do it. And that's all I relativism. God's not involved in your life at all that way. You want God involved in your life? Then say, Lord, I have no idea what I want to do. I have some desires but I'm not going to submit myself to those desires. I will submit to your will. When I was in junior high, I thought I was talented in in drawing and and things like that. I just loved to scribble and draw lines and things. And so I started taking drafting. And I got involved with uh, the drafting department in junior high. And I loved it. I liked it. So my goal was to become a architect. And so then I went and got to high school. I took drafting again, took architecture, went all the way to the top, became a, a TA, teacher's pet, or TP, you know. And, and, and Mr. Hidalgo was my teacher, and I, you know, Virginia was in the class too with me. She liked drafting too. We've got old drawings of houses and plot plans and various things that we did in high school. And this was my goal. I wanted to be an architect. And, of course, Virginia went and got pregnant. <laughs> You know, so there went my goal. <laughs> it's all her fault. No, it's, it was God directing me. Because he saw in my life something, I still don't know what it is today, that he knew that I'd be a pastor of a church in Mariloma. And I had no idea. I wasn't even saved. But he knew all that because he's in total control. And so he's guiding me and leading me, thinking, I'm thinking I'm in control, but he's telling me, no, I'm in control. And so instead of architecture, I had to go towards electronics. And so I started working for her father you know, and electronics. And then with Edison, with, um, because then I went to college, not for architecture, but I went for electronics because I needed to feed her and this kid, Modesto. <laughs> and, and I love doing it. I mean, that's why I changed directions. 
And then I get saved in Edison from some believers that were there and saw me and told me the story of King David. Had no idea who King David was. Gave me my first Bible. I mean, God just orchestrating everything. You know, I get saved. And he takes me to a Calvary Chapel and I learn everything that I need to learn there. Pastor gets sick, so I run that whole church for eight months. Comes back and they have to move. I stay here. I mean, just amazing how God just directs every, every step of the way. And it has nothing to do with I. And I just wish I would have learned to just say, Lord, whatever your will is, let me go in that direction. Because I have no idea. And I think we need to understand that. It's not in man who walks to direct his own steps. The Lord is your shepherd. The Lord is a shepherd. I just can't direct my own steps. He has to direct me as a shepherd. The shepherd is the one who tells the sheep where to go, when to feed, when to leave, when there's danger. The Lord, and God can do it completely. He says, O Lord, correct me, but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. And then he says this interesting statement here about Jacob, pour out your fury on the Gentiles, again, on these heathens uh, who do not know you, and on the families who do not call on your name, for they are, or they have eaten up Jacob, devoured him, and consumed him, and made his dwelling place desolate. So he goes back to Jacob. You know, I don't know why Jacob, uh, literally, but he's he's talking about the children of Israel, Judah, in particular, and how the Babylon is going to consume them. And he's asking God to, again, vindicate them after this judgment that He brings upon them. And then we come to. Chapter 11, and it's a new section here of the book. Um, The first section, he was in the temple, and he was ministering to the people, and now we come to a new message about breaking God's uh, covenant, and he speaks about Deuteronomy chapter 28, the blessings and the cursings that he promised them you remember that whole story and how God said that if you keep these commandments I will bless you if you don't keep these commandments then I will curse you and so he's reminding them of this uh, this covenant that he had made with them now it's a little different with us today we're no longer under that covenant we're under the covenant of grace and today as god will bless us he will have favor on us but there is our part also right we're to crucify the flesh we're to follow the the certain principles that god has established in the old testament we're follow the commandments in the new testament that he has established there and so in a sense there is a a a reaping of what you sow too so if you sow to the spirit then you will reap spiritual blessings but if you sow to the flesh then you will reap corruption curses you know unfortunately and that's god's principles and he sticks by that too the word that came to jeremiah from the lord saying hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of judah and to the inhabitants of jerusalem and say to them thus says the lord God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. Again, Deuteronomy chapter 28. You can read that on your own. Which I command your fathers in the day I brought them out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do not do according to all that I command you, and do according to all that I command you. So shall you be my people, and I will be your God, that I may establish the oath which I swore to your fathers, to give them a land flowing with milk and honey as it is to this day. And I answered and said, So be it, Lord. And that's Jeremiah saying, Yes, Lord, I'm going to go out and tell them immediately. I'm ready, in other words. Then the Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, saying, Hear the words of this covenant and do them. For I earnestly exhort your fathers in the day I brought you out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear. But everyone followed the dictates of his evil heart. I relativism again. That is their problem. Therefore I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant which I command them to do, but which they 
have not done. And the Lord said to me, A conspiracy has been found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They have turned back to their iniquities of their forefathers who refused to hear my words, and they have gone after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Interesting how he says they went back to their fathers. In other words, they went back to their old ways. They went back to their own culture. They went back to what they were doing with their families. You know, this is what we did when we grew up. This is where safety is. This is where it's enjoyable. This is, you know, that type of garbage. And God says, nope, I will judge you because you're not obedient. I will bring disaster upon you. Look at verse 11. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will surely bring calamity on them, which they will not be able to escape. And though they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Then the cities of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods to whom they offer incense, and they will not save them at all in a time of their trouble. For according to the number of your cities, where your gods, O Judah, and according to the number of the streets of Jerusalem, you have set up altars to that shameful thing, altars to burn incense to Baal. Now, back at that time, they had altars on every street. So you can imagine the opportunity to burn incense and offer up offerings to Baal at all times. And God says, I'm not going to listen to you. What he's doing there is he's letting them go so that they realize that their way isn't the right way, that there's no help for them in that way. And they won't get help that way because God isn't a part of it. Oh, cry out to your altars. Cry out to your gods. Let's see if they help you. Let's see if things change. And of course, they're not going to change. Because God's not involved in it. I had a friend years ago, a really nice guy. He used to go street witnessing here in the community. Had owned his own business. I would meet him periodically <clears throat> for lunch out there in, in Ontario. Um, <clears throat> on fire for the Lord. And, and we were just really serving the Lord together. Uh, out witnessing, hitting the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, and various things like that, just having a great time. He he was just really on fire. And then one day, uh, we were out at lunch, and he just started crying. He says, I can't do this anymore. I'm like, what's wrong? He says, I've sinned. I've sinned. I've gone back to my old life. Wow. Yeah. I don't know where that was. And I, I kind of said, what do you mean? He goes, I've gone back to my old life. I'm now, he wasn't married at the time. So, you know, I'm just out dating women, sleeping with them, and just back to that old life. I go, you need to stop. You need to stop. Just stop. No, it's too late. I've gone too far. I go, no, no, you haven't gone too far. He goes, God can't help me. God isn't there anymore. And I go, you're right. And he's letting you go. And he's letting you taste what it's like to be without him. And then he starts sharing some really disgusting things that was going on. I go, dude, you are going downhill. You need to stop it right now. I mean, God is good. His word is true. And if you confess it, he's faithful to forgive it. But you need to turn from this. You know, but he didn't want to. And he just kept going. And he just continued to spiral down. And he just left the Lord completely. You can't do it without the Lord. can't do it without the Lord. And he knew it because he knew his word. And it haunted him, but he wasn't willing to give it up. And that is so sad. (sighs) Listen to what God says to them. So, do not pray for this people. Or lift up a cry or prayer for them. For I will not hear them in the time that they cry out to me because of their trouble. What has my beloved to do in my house? Having done lewd deeds with many, in other words, why are they here to worship me when they're wrong, when they're doing their own thing, when are doing wrong things, when they're sleeping with others and so forth, when they're into idolatry, then this 
spiritual idolatry with the idols and so forth, why are they in my house? Why are they here? You know, when you come to the Old Testament, the, the Bible's really clear. It takes this principle that God has is uh, to kick them out. You know, he says if, if a brother is sinning and they're involved in sin and they continue to practice these sins, you need to kick them out. They shouldn't be a part of the church. Paul even said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of a couple that were sinning. You need to kick them out. In fact, I've already prayed and I've, I, I pray that the Lord take their bodies that their souls would be saved. You know? So there's this principle where God says people need to learn their lessons. They need to just go, get out, do it yourself, see what happens. You know? And don't pray for them. There's a time when you don't pray for certain things. You know? And I've shared this before. You know, someone said, pray for my divorce. I'm like, Pray for your divorce. I'm not praying for your divorce. God doesn't want you divorced. You know what? You, that's what's wrong with you. <laughs> Pray for your divorce. You know those type of prayers aren't prayers that that we should be praying for people. Pray you repent. Pray you come back to God. You know that's what I pray for. And there are prayers we shouldn't be praying. You know, pray that my you know spouse does exactly what I say. That, I'm not going to pray for that. You know, that's not a proper prayer. I pray you humble yourself. You know, both of you humble yourselves and love one another as the Bible says to love one another. Pray that I get rich. No, I'm not going to pray for that either. You know, reminds me of a guy, <clears throat> a guy who uh, used to tithe uh, when he was poor. And he just told the Lord, I promise I'll tithe to you and you continue to bless me, I'll continue to tithe. And so he, he did and then the Lord started to bless him and he was being so blessed that he was giving a lot of money, thousands of dollars to the church. And all of a sudden he stopped. He stopped giving. And so the pastor said, hey, I noticed that you stopped giving to the church. What happened? He goes, that's a lot of money. He goes, that's a lot of money. I mean, I could afford it when I was you know, poor and just could give a couple of bucks here and there. And he goes, just pray for me. And the pastor says, okay, let's pray. Lord, I pray you bring him back down to where he's making nothing. At least he was faithful with it, you know. That's the prayer, not that you make more, but you be faithful to the Lord. There are things that we shouldn't pray about. McGee was really big on that. You read some of McGee's commentaries and, and he'll say that, oh, I don't pray for that. I'm not going to pray for that, brother. You know, we pray the Lord re cause your heart to repent. <laughs> The Lord called your name, green olive tree, lovely and of good fruit, with the noise of a great tumult. He has kindled fire on it, and its branches are broken. For the Lord of hosts who planted you has pronounced doom against you for the evil of the house of Israel and of the house of Judah, which they have done against themselves to provoke me to anger in offering incense to Baal. I highlight that in your Bible, to themselves. You know, when people sin, they only hurt themselves. I used to have that attitude when I was younger. Whenever I got punished, my mom would punish me or my dad would punish me. I would say, okay, I'll get back at you. And so I'd go to school and I wouldn't study. Ha ha, I'm not going to study. I got F. Ha ha, how do you like that? And I thought I was getting them. Now that I'm older, it's like, I, only got my, I can't spell. You know, who did I hurt? And they're, they're still doing fine, you know, but I can't spell. And that's how dumb we are sometimes. You know, I'll get back at you. You know, and we think we're hurting them, but in reality, who do we hurt? Ourselves. And that's what God is saying here to them. They only hurt themselves. No one else. But I won. <laughs> yeah, okay, he won. Good for you. Now the Lord... <laughs> Verse 18, now the Lord gave, gave me knowledge of it and I know it for you. Show me your doings or their doings. But I was like a docile lamb brought to the slaughter. And I did not know that they had this devised schemes against me saying, let us destroy the tree with its fruits and let us cut down or cut him off from the land of the living that his name may be remembered no more. But the Lord of hosts you who judge. Now, Jeremiah is the one speaking here. And he's talking about how they're punishing him now because of, because of him telling the truth. You know, and how it's coming back at him. And he's the one being attacked by his own family too. But the O Lord of hosts, you who judge righteously, testing the minds and the hearts, let me see your vengeance on them. 
for to you I have revealed my cause. He kind of like, well, God, if you're going to judge them, then, hey, God, show me your vengeance on my own family. You know, really get them. Yeah, I like that. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the men of, of Anthoth, which is Jeremiah's hometown, who seek your life, saying, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. So his own family, his own family, and we've been hearing this lately, you know, in, in the Christian realm, how family, there's struggles in families and fights over property and rights and things like this, you know, it's just crazy stuff and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be in family, but here Jeremiah, a prophet of God, preaching the truth of God, sticking with it in his own family, saying, well, you need to shut your mouth, otherwise we'll kill you. That's family for you, right? And I think we all have family like this. I don't know of anyone who doesn't have struggles in family. Someone said, or actually D.L. Moody said, a man ought to live so that everybody knows he is a Christian. And most of all, his family ought to know. Good way to live. Does that mean you'll be persecuted? You better believe it. But they should know you're a Christian and you're going to stand by your principles and what you believe to be true, no matter what. I've taken that to heart personally and I've gotten into a lot of trouble. And I shared this with you before. I literally stopped fellowshipping with somebody because they were living in sin. And this was a very close family member. And boy, did my siblings get mad at me. What kind of Christian are you? You have no love, really. That's what the Bible says. One even called up Chuck Smith on the phone, on, on the radio, and asked, my brother's doing this, what do you think? And Chuck just says, well, it's what the Bible says. I don't know what to tell you. I know it's difficult and hard, but he's right. Oh! <laughs> you know. But you know what? When you stand by the Word of God, and you know it's the Word of God, then you put your faith in God completely. In Matthew ten thirty five thirty seven 37 says, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves his son or daughters more than me is not worthy of me. If you don't love God more than your own family, then you're not worthy of God. We have to make that distinction. Blew me away when I heard Rawls' testimony and he was talking about getting involved in the ministry. Now that his whole life has changed and so he tells his wife excitedly, I'm going to get involved in the ministry. And the wife says, no, I didn't marry you for that. So he said, there's the door, leave. Because <laughs> I'm going to serve the Lord. And that's how I felt. That's how I felt. I was like, if you want to serve with me, great. If not, you know, then do your own thing. I remember we were in, in the situation where we were trying to figure out what church we were going to. And so um, I had found a Calvary. She was still going to a Catholic church. She still wasn't saved yet. And so she's like, well, you need to go to church where we used to go to church. I says, no, this place is feeding me. Tell you what, you go there. If that's where you want to go, take the boys there, but I'm staying here. And so she went the first time. And then the second time she says, I've been trying to get you to church for so many years and now you're going to church and you're still not with us. And so I'm going to go with you. Yeah. And the Lord used that because you stand by your convictions and what the word of God says and either God will change a person or push them away. And that's what happens with family. It's part of the ministry. <laughs> As hard it is, it, as hard as it is, it is part of the ministry. James says, "This is why: what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions are at war within you? You ever get like that? You're so passionate about something, it's like war, and you just gotta say something, and so you end up saying it. And it's your passions at war in you that causes the stir in your family." I don't like what you're saying. I don't believe what you're saying. And so I don't care for that. So I'm going to kill you, J Jeremiah. Say one more word from God and you're dead. You know, and the war is within them because it convicts them. Because it, it means they have to change and they don't want to change. And so they start fighting. 
It says, you desire and yet you have not. How we desire to change people and what they believe. Whether right or wrong, we have no right to change anybody. I can't change you. I can only present the truth. And it's up to you to make your decision whether you want to believe that what I'm saying is the truth and then apply it to your own lives. And I think by just reading the text like we do on Wednesdays, it's pretty easy to know it's God's word coming out, not mine. But we have this idea to change someone. We have a desire for something and we want to change that person. We want them to do it my way and we want to do it that way and blah, blah, blah. But we don't have it. And so we get angry, we get mad. And so he says, so you murder. And that's what they were doing. You're telling us to repent, Jeremiah? You're telling us to get rid of our idols, Jeremiah? You're telling us to get right with God, Jeremiah? No, 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 we don't like that. We like our gods. They look nice on our mantles. We're not going to get rid of them. No, 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 Jeremiah, we're going to kill you because we're tired of hearing those words come out of your mouth. It says, you covet and cannot obtain. So you fight and you quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And I think that if we just ask God, say, Lord, you change them. Lord, it's not my place. You've been doing this for a long time. And I know that you can take care of them. Boy, how much more would we get done through prayer? Paul even says that we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against powers and principalities, you know, of the air. And so we ought to be in prayer That's where things change is when we pray and get on our knees and seek God and ask Him to do the work. Him to work in a person's life. Him to change them. Let God do it. That's His job, not our job. When I first started the ministry, I had a guy uh, who was with me and he was always correcting me and telling me that was wrong, that was wrong, that was wrong. I says, why are you doing this? He says, because I am in a sense the Holy Spirit. I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, well, you're not going to last very long. Because he was there to make sure I did everything right. And he didn't. He didn't last very long. You can't do that. It's not how it works. You have to let God work through the people that he has called. See, what I have found personally is that you have two types of people. (laughs) Two types of people. You have an initiator and then you have a responder. And that's always the case. You have an initiator and a responder. <clears throat> Someone's always, always initiating. They feel like they have the right to tell you how you ought to live, how you ought to do things, and so they initiate those things. Those are the people that don't like certain things done certain ways, and so they get nitpicky on, on things and how church is running and, and so forth and things aren't running and you know various things like that in church or in your lives i don't like the way you fold your clothes i don't like the way you put your clothes on the floor and you leave them there you know i like the way you put the toilet paper i don't like the way you squeeze the tooth you know those are the initiators the responders are trying now to respond to that and they don't do very well sometimes (laughs) you know well that's the way i've done it all my life sorry i'll try to change that i'll pick pick it up you know and so forth they're the responders usually the responders are the ones that get in trouble more than the initiators. Because the, res- the initiators are always looking at things that are true, that have some, some truth in it. Yeah, the toothpaste really is bad when it's squeezed all like that and you don't get everything out because some of it's in the bottom, in the middle, and it's, you know, stuff, that type of thing. And the response says, but that's how I've done it. Well, change. It's hard to change after, you know, doing it for 25 years and so you're trying, but then you forget and so forth. There are a lot of people that agree with that and they'll agree with you as an initiator. And that's how you convince people to leave a church or to divorce in a situation or to riot in, in, in a company and so forth because the boss is cruel and mean and isn't fair, you know, because they initiate things and then they have to respond. And I have just found that eventually the responder becomes the, the problem in the eyes of the initiators. And so now the responder who just is responding, he really doesn't initiate things. He just wants to let things go and just move on because he's learned that people are different. You know, not everything is run the same way. There's not one way or one wrong way. You know, he's just learned that God can work through all these things. And so he just understands that. 
But as soon as an initiator responds, then he's got to respond, right? And so he does, and he ends up getting in trouble because it's not the right way according to the initiator and, and other people. And that's one of the problems in marriage, in families, is you have your initiators and you have your responders. And you know who you are, you know, and you know where you stand because you initiate or you respond. And what we need to fall back on is what we've been studying tonight is we need to let God do the work and trust in him and apply the principles that we know are there. Chuck used to always say, look, when we're in doubt of a lot of things, then fall back to what you do know. And that is what? That we're to love God and we're to love one another. That's what we do know. All the other stuff I don't know. I don't know as much. I don't know how you get through that. I don't know how you, you know, fix that. I have no idea. And it works differently with everyone. But we do know that we're to love one another. And so let's fall back on that. Let us just love one another. Let us somehow stir our hearts up to be faithful to God in loving one another so that we don't have the arguments and the struggles in our relationships like we do. Right now, personally, my brother wants nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with us. And I'm probably the bad guy because I introduce Christianity to the family. And so what do I do? I'm not going to respond. I'm just going to leave him alone and let God do something. Let God work in his life. You know, God saved me. Nobody came around to me and started witnessing to me. Nobody tried to force me into it. No one brought a Bible to me and said, you need to read this. God just saved me out of the blue, listening to the radio. So I know he can save my brother out of the blue. He doesn't need me to go in there and start stirring things up. I can just leave him alone. I know he doesn't like it. Well, he really doesn't care. Otherwise, he'd be here. You know, that's just a tactic that they use you know, to draw attention to themselves. God needs to work in his life. And then when that happens, hey, he's my brother. I'm going to hug him and welcome him into the family of God You know, because that's the thing to do. But I have to let God work in his life. Have to let God work in his life. But unfortunately, like Jeremiah, like Jesus said, you know, he came to bring a sword to families, fathers and sons and mothers and mother in laws, because people will not agree on the truth. You know, there's only one truth, and it's it's right here in the Bible. One truth. You hear Christians say, Well, that's your opinion, and my opinion is this no one of you are wrong. Because there's only one truth. And so you have to determine what that truth is. And that's why you should have been to that inductive Bible class. Because you would have known exactly what the truth is when you inductively study the Bible. In its context. Finding the main point. And you know exactly what God's talking about. You know, those are the things we should be doing because we want to know truth. Because ultimately the, the responder is the one that says, I want to know God. And I want to have that relationship with God. And I want God to work because I know that to be true. Now, not generally speaking, not always. In, not always. But that initiator, he wants his own way. He, he's the I relativism. He's the cultural relativism. You know, so for trying to change things, trying to do works and stuff like that, where, where God is the one that needs to do it. And, and if we just take him for his word and trust him completely, He'll bless us. He'll bless our relationships. He'll bless our families. But that's not the case at all times. So Jeremiah is just lamenting over the fact that his own brothers and families want to kill him. Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will punish them. The young men shall die by the sword. Their sons and their daughters shall die by famine. And there shall be no remnant of them. For I will bring catastrophe on the men of Enoch, even the year of their punishment. And of course, he's not talking about believers. These are unbelievers who don't like Jeremiah and, and God's basically going to answer Jeremiah's prayer. They'll be judged and killed by the sword. I really thought that was interesting as I read that. I'm thinking, wow, Lord, because he's been really ministering to me in that area of family and, and so forth. Uh, and I don't want to say names. Uh, someone who we dearly love and the struggles they're going through just um, is part of this world, unfortunately. And when we begin to put value in our own thoughts, in our own ways, 
that's when we begin to fight and argue instead of humbling ourselves before the Lord. I mean, isn't that what the disciples did? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, Lord? Who's going to serve? Who's going to sit at your right hand? Who's going to, you know, who's going to do that? These are the initiators. You know, these are initiators. And Jesus just said, hey, that's not, I can't tell you that. That's all my father will decide that. Why are you worried about that stuff? Just serve me. Man, it's just crazy stuff. Why, why do we have gray chairs? Why gray? I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> There's people dying out there. They're losing their souls. Let's worry about that. Yeah, but gray? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, you're not getting it. You know, understand what is important and what are the priorities. And we argue over these little things. You know? Yeah, we want to do the best we can. We want the place to look nice. But when it causes arguments, fine, pull the carpets out. You know, let the hippies come in with no shoes if that's what we need to do. You know, because that's what's important.